Thank you. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon from Malaysia. Alaikum assalam Thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to interact uh, with this assembly of August uh, at the missions. Today we are going to talk about three different but interrelated topics, learning outcomes, multiple choice questions and item analysis. But let's look at the learning outcomes of this question first. By the end of this session, the participants would be able to define learning outcomes, differentiate between program learning outcomes, course learning outcomes, and topic learning outcomes. Explain the link between learning outcomes and assessment methods. Construct multiple choice questions in relation to learning outcomes. Explain the concept of difficulty and discrimination indices and construct multiple choice questions based on Bloom's taxonomy or Miller's pyramid concept. In the next 10 slides, I'm going to talk about learning outcomes and their relation with the content of the curriculum, the teaching learning strategies and assessment methods. Learning outcomes represent what is achieved and assessed at the end of a course of a study and not the aspirations are what is intended to be achieved. This statement differentiates between learning outcomes and learning objectives. Learning outcome is a very specific statement that describes exactly what a student will be able to do in some measurable way after attending a course. The learning outcomes are described as smart, that is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. And they are described by using action verbs. Here is a list of action verbs that can be used to describe learning outcomes according to Bloom's taxonomy. For example, in knowledge, the action verbs that can be used is list, define, recall, or arrange. In synthesis level, the action verbs would be create, compose, argue, or design, and in evaluation stage, maybe assess and judge, value, revise, and so on. The learning outcomes are defined differently for different levels of training. Learning outcomes focus on what student is able to do at the end of a session, and that would be called the topic learning outcome because it is at the end of a session. Or if it is at the end of a course, it would be called the course learning outcomes and if it is at the end of the program, it would be called program learning outcome. There is another term used, which is program educational uh, outcomes, uh, uh, pro uh, program educational objectives also. These are the learning outcomes which a graduate is expected to achieve few years after graduation. It may be regarding the specialization or attainment of certain skills. The Malaysian Medical Council and Malaysian Qualification Agency categorizes the program learning outcomes under following headings or areas, which is knowledge and understanding, cognitive skills, practical skills, interprofessional skills, uh, interpersonal skills, communication skills, and so on, till the ethics and professionalism. 
Here is an example of a program learning outcome and program educational uh, learning outcome. This program learning outcome relates to ethics and professionalism category, and it states that at graduation, the student would be able to practice professionalism with ethical values in performing medical and healthcare services. And the related program educational objective would be that the physicians are surgeons because they, this is a few years after graduation. They will adhere to the professional course of ethics and enhance the humanistic values in overcoming challenges of the progress uh, of the profession. So this means that the educational program is not only aiming at the time of graduation, but also what happens many years after graduation. So the, uh, the teaching program should uh, have this ability to maintain these capabilities even years after graduation. The learning outcomes dictate us what should be the content, what should be the teaching learning activities and strategies and how students should be assessed. When we align the assessment tasks, the teaching learning strategies and the content with the learning outcome, it is termed as constructive alignment. Here is an example of a constructive alignment. The learning outcome, for example, here, upon graduation, a student will be able to perform lumbar puncture under supervision and interpret the results. And then the contents are accordingly identified. Teaching learning strategies are devised and assessment methods are decided. For example, in this content, if we take the example of taking consent, the teaching learning strategy would be role play and assessment would be OSCE or OSPE. Role play, of course, cannot be taught in a lecture and cannot be assessed in, in a written form. So we need to use methods different than lectures and, and written assessment and therefore we have chosen the role play and OSCE. Then another aspect which we need to be familiar with while uh, assessing the students using the learning outcomes is blueprinting. Blueprinting is appropriate spread of to be sampled capabilities, that is the learning outcomes among different systems and different domains. Applying uh, blueprinting leads us to constructive alignment, which we have just defined. It ensures validity and authenticity, and it avoids unnecessary duplication. Because otherwise, the same topic may be examined um, multiple times through different uh, assessment methods. So therefore, blueprinting causes or creates a balance among the uh, capabilities which are being assessed. Different uh, objectives of assessment needs different assessment tools. For example, multiple choice questions can assess knowledge, comprehension, interpretation, and to some extent, problem solving. So this gives us the introduction are the basis to move forward in, in our this session uh, after understanding what learning outcomes are and how they are related to teaching and learning and the assessment methods. Now let's talk about multiple choice questions. Broadly speaking, multiple choice questions are divided into two groups multiple true or false questions and single best answer questions. Under the heading of multiple true or false questions, there are a number of categories. Type X, where we select each option independently. Type K, where selection is combination of options. 
type B is matching format, type C is matching format with um, all of above or none of above options, and type E is assertion reason format. Whereas the single best option questions, there are two types. Type A are best answer question or single best answer question. This is the best among the options is uh, selected, which may not be necessarily uh, absolute truth. And second is extended matching time. The commonly used uh, types of multiple choice questions are these two best answer questions and some people call it single best answer questions and extended matching questions. And in today's session, we would be talking about these two types of multiple choice questions. Overall, the advantages of multiple choice questions that they cover broad learning outcomes and improve the reliability of the assessment. MCQs examine broad subject areas in a short time. They test large number of students with relatively few resources. They are marked by optical reader, so making the marking more reliable. They are not affected by scorers' inconsistencies and are not influenced by students' writing ability because students have to simply select or choose the already uh, decided or uh, are presented options. Well-constructed multiple choice questions can be used to assess more complex mental processes than simple recall of uh, knowledge. And these complex processes may include comprehension, discrimination, interpretation, analysis, making infer uh, inferences and even problem solving. MCQs are easily analyzed by the computer, which helps in the improvement of items for further use. However, there are some challenges as well. MCQs are difficult to construct in a large number, avoiding common pitfalls. And these common pitfalls include ambiguity in the language. So it's sometimes our, uh, the questions are not very clear. They may prompt a correct answer, and sometimes we may just lift the sentences from the book. So we need to avoid these uh, uh, pitfalls if we want to make a good multiple choice questions. They are also difficult to construct for measuring complex learning uh, outcomes. We need um, to really make a good effort if we want to assess complex learning outcomes by using uh, multiple choice questions. Normally, they are cued towards testing recall of knowledge and therefore the element of guessing comes in. In MCQs, the statements have to be defensively true or absolutely false. So this means that the uh, areas which have some debate about it are not really well accepted, would be difficult to assess in multiple choice questions. Statements with even minor degree of ambiguity will lead to guessing by the students. And the, they do not reflect correctly the student's knowledge specifically for options marked false. For example, a student picks up correctly and states that this option is false, but that does not necessarily mean that students know what is the true statement. And of course, staff needs to learn how to develop good items and they cannot assess performance and attitude. So these are the limitations of multiple choice questions. Moving on, now let's talk about the characteristics of different types of multiple choice questions. And first we will talk about single best answer type or BAQ. The BAQ or best answer question is a type of multiple choice question with a stem 
which is followed by four or five related options. This is important. The very characteristic statement for BAQ that all the options are correct to a varying degree, but only one is comparatively best or absolutely correct answer. And this correct answer is called the key to the question. Remaining three or four options are called as distractors. The structure of uh, best answer question, there is a stem followed by lead in question, then a key or answer and three or four distractors. Here is an example. A five-year-old boy with congenital heart disease presents with signs of congestive cardiac failure. The pediatrician directs to uh, start treatment with an ACE inhibitor. So this is the stem of this BAQ. Following the advice of pediatrician, which one of the following anti-failure drugs is most suitable for the treatment of this patient? And this is the lead in uh, question. These are the options. And here is the key, the capital and these are the distractors. Another example, a researcher in pharmacy laboratory wants to compare the potency of two drugs. That's the stem. Which one of the following measures is the most suitable to be applied in this situation? This would be the lead-in statement or lead-in question. And then these are the options a therapeutic index, bioavailability, half-life, and maximum tolerated dose. Here is a diagrammatic representation of a BAQ where we have five options. All of them are correct, but one is the most correct than the other, and that would be the key or answer to the question. This is the sample answer sheet. And in this type of question, students have to choose only one option which they think is the best um, item in that question. Now, some uh, tips and guidelines on the construction of uh, uh, best answer question. First is on the STEM. The STEM introduces the theme or problem clearly. It provides enough relevant information avoiding unnecessary details. This is important because unnecessary details would confuse the student and also waste time. The STEM is a complete statement which can be answered without reading the alternatives. So this is what we call is cover test. This means that a good student will be able to answer that question even if the options are hidden. This means that the STEM is so clear that a good student would be able to answer that uh, a leading question even without looking at the option list. The STEM generally comprises of clinical vignettes and there are reasons for that because they improve the validity of assessment. They are naturally better constructed and usually require problem solving skills. Constructing the options, they must be homogeneous, means that we cannot have um, uh, different uh, uh, options in, in the sense that they totally assess unrelated areas. So either we have all the statements related to diagnosis, our investigations, our mechanisms of disease, our treatments, et cetera. The, all the options are plausible, as we said previously, that every uh, option is have some degree of truth. Uh, and uh, so they are not totally wrong. They are reasonable and attractive. They are linked with the, state, uh, with the stem and they are logical. However, we can use common misconceptions and beliefs as options, and each option have, uh, has a uh, ring of truth. The options 
match the correct response in length, complexity, phrasing, and style. So this is to deal with uh, exam savvy students. So the uh, key and the distractor should match as much as possible. Uh, we shouldn't be choosing tricky or picky things. And we should avoid non-essential topics. We should have a grammatically correct ending to the leading statement or answer to the question. However, sometimes a completely false distractor can be used if no other option is available and the question is testing an important aspect of the course. So it is um, the condition that the question is really, really important and uh, there's no other possible option. Only then we can use uh, a completely false distractor in, in, in a BAQ. Next, formatting of uh, these items are options. Construct each item to assess a single specific written objective. So make sure that one statement, one option, or one item does not assess more than one objective. If we do so, it would end up with measuring lower level of competence or covering trivial matter that is of little educational worth. Base each item on a specific problem, which is clearly stated in the STEM, and students should be ideally able to answer the lead-in question without reading the option that the cover test, which I just mentioned, uh, that is the one way of assessing the quality of a single best answer question. Here is uh, an example of a, a single best answer question, but you will see there is no stem. Which one of the following pathogens is most common cause of bronchiolitis? It's the influenza virus, adenovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, mycoplasma pneumonia, or rhinovirus. So as you see, this is not a good question because it simply assesses the recall of the student and there is no assessment of higher mental functions or complex situations. So you see that if we do not have a stem that actually compromises the quality of, of the question. Right, now we will talk now about the extended matching type. First, we uh, discussed uh, about the features of uh, single best answer questions. And now we are moving on to extended matching type. The extended matching type of questions, they have a theme, they have an option list, they have a lead in statement and they have steps. Here is an example. The theme is immune response. The options are mechanism of immune response and there are eight options here. And then there is a lead in statement which says for each of the following scenarios, choose the most important mechanism of immune response from the option list provided. And then these stems are given. Let's look at the number four here. A 14 year old boy with complaints of difficulty in breathing and tightness of chest for last three hours after visiting a florist. A similar episode had occurred in the past when he went to a rose garden. Now students have to match this stem with an appropriate option, which for example, in this case would be C, the release of mediators by mast cells. Now it is called extended matching because the option number is more than, than the stems. If, uh, so one option can be used multiple times as well. So it is not matching type, it is extended matching type because the, their number do not tell you. If it is matching time, uh, type, then usually the last statement would match automatically. 
Now, here uh, I'll show you another interesting example of uh, EMQ. Here, now the theme is facial expressions. Options, picture of different facial expressions. Now here we have uh, the different uh, facial expressions. You see the A, B, C, D, E, and F, and, and G. So these, these are the options. And then we have the lead-in statement, match the following descriptions with the above pictures. And then we have these uh, descriptions, the fear, contempt, anger, surprise, sadness, and happiness. For example, fear, in, if we are attempting this question, would be probably A, right? And the, if we uh, look at the, let's say, happiness, of course, it would be uh, the F. So this is an example of an extended matching type questions where we have options and we have uh, this uh, expression and, and matching them. Right, so let me go back to the uh, original presentation. Right. Okay, now here is another example of uh, uh, EMQ. The theme is chest pain. The options, the causes of chest pain, so angina and aortic stenosis and others. And then the leading statement for each of the following patients with chest pain, select the most likely cause from the option list provided. And here is the step. A 70 two-year-old man presents with worsening chest pain uh, of one hour duration and so on. And the student has to choose the right option for this stem. Uh, so if we go here, the pain radiates to his back and on examination, the blood pressure is different in two arms. And obviously the, the choice would be here in this case for the dissecting aortic aneurysm. Similarly, there's a, another stem here. And again, the student will need to choose the appropriate option which relates to, to this stem. So this uh, was the some characteristics of extended matching question. Now talking about the MCQs overall are all types. So the stem or heading can be in the form of a question, an incomplete simple statement, a short clinical scenario, a, a laboratory report, or a picture. The alternatives are options or items are stated replies, which are either absolute true or false statement, are statements with variable degree of truth, with one option being absolute truth or near truth. Of, obviously, this would depend upon the, the type of question we are using. Correct response is called the key, while the incorrect responses are called the distractors. Right, now after uh, going through these types of question, the next thing we want to do is item analysis. That is analyzing each option or item as well as questions. There are two types of item analysis. The one, first one is qualitative item analysis. And it is the process in which lecturers ex are experts care carefully proofread the test or the uh, exam questions before it is administered. And purpose here is to look for any typo errors, any grammatical clues, and to ensure that level of reading material is appropriate for the level of students' uh, training. The second type is a quantitative item analysis. 
uh, which we will be going into detail after this. And it is a statistical technique. It's meant to know about the test items on the basis of three numerical indicators. The first one is difficulty index. And here, whether the test item was easy or difficult for the specific group of students. Second, discrimination index, which means that how well the items discriminated between high and low scorers in the test. And third is distractor analysis, if all the alternative, uh, alternative or distractors functioned as intended, because in a good question, the distractor should be uh, good enough to make it difficult for student to, to differentiate. Now, talking about the item difficulty, the item difficulty of an individual item is the percentage or ratio of students sitting for the specific examination who answered the item correctly. So it is a ratio or a percentage uh, and depends upon the number of students who offer, uh, answered correctly. It is the relative frequency with which examiners choose the correct response. It has a difficulty level ranging from 0% to 100%. And it provides a common metric to compare items that measure different domains. So uh, we can compare the different disciplines like, for example, anatomy and physiology. So comparing items on the basis of performance of students in different disciplines. So item difficulty can help us not only to uh, assess the students, but also to compare their performance in different disciplines. Here, uh, how it is calculated. So uh, if we are using the optical reader, the software would uh, obviously calculate uh, item difficulty for us, uh, but it, I think it's important to know the basic concept that how it is calculated and we can even uh, calculate manually if we want. So item difficulty is equal to number of students with correct response divided by total number of students examined multiplied by 100. So this is simply a percentage of students who are answering their questions uh, correctly. So the higher the percentage means the easier the item and vice versa. Obviously, the, when the percentage is high, means the number of students who answer that question correct is very high. And that may mean that the question was relatively easy. So high, it is a kind of misnomer. The high difficulty index means easier question. So this type of item difficulty is dependent on the performance of the students, of course, because this is a, a, a relevant um, and this is in relation to performance of the students. If the students are good, then the, the uh, the, the difficulty index would be high, but if students are poor, the overall difficulty index would be low. The, let's take an example. If we have 110 students who attempted the item and all 110 students got the answer correct, then the difficulty is 110 over 110 is equal to one multiplied by 100 is equal to 100%. That means that question is very, very easy. On the other hand, if out of these 110 students, 50 students have entered a correct answer, then the item difficulty would be 50 over 110 multiplied by uh, 100, which would be around 45%. So this is a moderately uh, difficult uh, question. And if none of the students answered that question, that means 0 over 110 means 0 multiplied by 100. So 
uh, difficulty in index is 0%, which means very, very difficult question. The, what should be the optimal uh, difficulty index? Too easy or too difficult items for a group will make it hard to identify reliable inter-individual differences. So we should have a proper ratio of uh, different levels of questions. Otherwise, we, our results, the reliability may be uh, questioned. The optimal difficulty depends on the number of test items and the chance score. Now, this is an important point to understand so that we can interpret the, the difficulty index uh, uh, properly. And we need to understand the concept of chance score. So for a question, uh, for a correct response to a question, the total score or perfect score is one. So if that question has four alternatives, this means there is a 0.25% chance of guessing. So because there are four statements, so a student can choose any one by guessing. So it would be 0.25%. Um, percent. And this would be called the mean chance score, right? And in other words, is the, the, the frequency with which a student can guess the answer to, to that question. Now, to calculate the optimal difficulty for such an item would be halfway between perfect score and mean chance, means average of perfect score and the mean chance. So in this case, the perfect score is one and mean chance is point. 25 and their average would be 0.625. So this difficulty index would be the optimal index for this type of uh, item uh, uh, under consideration. If we talk about the whole test, so for a 40 item test composed of five options MCQs, the maximum perfect score of the test would be 41 for each question. But because there are five options, though there is the, the chances, the mean chance score or guessing would be one fifth, which is would be eight, one fifth of 40. And the optimal difficulty would be 40 plus eight, 48 divided by two is 24. So in this case, the optimal difficulty index uh, for that test would be 24. So based on the number of items and the, the, the whether we are using four options or five options, we can calculate the optimal difficulty index. And once we get the report, for example, from optical reader about the difficulty index based on this calculation, we can have an idea the difficulty uh, index or difficulty, uh, the optimal difficulty index of our, for that test. So in general, the guidelines for use of difficulty index are that the if difficulty index is from zero to point two, then it is very difficult question. In that case, we should look whether the if the right the key entered in the answer sheet or, or in OMR is right. Sometimes if key is um, entered wrongly, that would make the item difficult. Then look at the 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 question itself. Whether the, because if question is uh, confusing, then students would not be able to answer, and that will be labeled as difficulty question. But if key is right and the question is perfectly clear and no uh, uh, ambiguity, then probably this area needs to be taught again and more carefully. So this is how the difficulty index can help us in our uh, teaching program. From point two to point four is difficult. 
from 0.4 to 0.6 is average or, or moderate. And uh, that's often used. Above 0.6 to up to 0.8 is very easy. Uh, so that should not be used commonly. And above 0.8 is very, very easy. So based on this difficulty index, we can uh, have a test uh, which ranges and covers all different areas. So items with moderate index of difficulty, that is for, for, uh, from 0.4 to 0.6 is recommended as it shows more reliable scores. Now let's go to the second uh, a type of item analysis and it is the item discrimination. It is the degree to which an item discriminates between students of high and low achievements. Items with good di discrimination improve the assessment's ability to discriminate between participants of different ability levels. Difficult items tend to discriminate between those who know and those who do not know the answer. Items with low or negative discrimination lower the reliability of the assessment or threaten validity of the results. I'll explain this point further in a short while. Uh, obviously, it is expected that high performers are more likely to answer good items correctly as compared to low performers who would um, uh, answered incorrectly. Now, again, the discrimination index can be calculated or is usually calculated by the software in uh, optical reader. But to understand that how it is calculated and how it's utilized, let's look at these few slides. If we want to calculate it uh, manually, then we arrange the scores marks in order from highest to lowest. So all the marks which have, uh, we put them in this order. And then we identify the higher group and the lower group. Higher group means 27% of the students on the upper side and lower uh, means that 27% on from the bottom. So 27% from the top would make the higher group and 27% from the bottom would make the uh, lower group. So remaining 46% middle students are not included in this analysis. So if we take the same example of 110 um, uh, students, the 27% uh, would make roughly 30 students. So here we are talking about 30 students from the top and 30 students uh, from the bottom. So this is the formula to calculate the number of students who answered that particular items correctly in the higher group minus number of students who answered I that item correctly in the lower group and then divided by number of students in higher or lower group because that number is same. In our example here, because there are 30, we calculated the 30 students. So there would be 30 students in higher group, 30 students in the lower group. So all 30 students in the higher group got the answer correct while none of the 30 students in the lower group got it correct. If that is the situation, the discrimination index would be one. That is 30 minus zero over 30 is, is one. That means the uh, very high discrimination. In another situation, if 20 students in the higher group got the answer correct, while 10 students in the lower group got it correct, then 20 minus 10 divided by 30. So here, our uh, discrimination index would be 0.33. On the other hand, if 20 students in the higher group got the answer correct, while 26 in the lower group, this means that the students in the lower group 
uh, are answering more correctly than the higher group. In this case, the discrimination would uh, come up in the negative. So how to interpret the discrimination index? For example, if the discrimination index is 0.19, and there are 30 uh, students in the group. So 0.19 times 30 makes around six students. This means that six students in uh, more, uh, six more high group students got the answer correct than as compared to a lower group. If the uh, discrimination index is 0.33, that would mean that 10 more students in the higher a group answered uh, correctly as compared to lower group. On the other hand, if the discrimination index is in negative, this means that the lower group students are answering uh, uh, correctly as compared to higher group. So there must be something wrong uh, with, with the question. So how to use discrimination uh, index? The general guidelines, if the discrimination index is negative, so that, that item should be not used, should be rejected as more higher group students are, are uh, uh, the more lower group students are, are answering correctly. If it is up to 0.19, these are poor items and they should, um, Either they should be rejected or they should be improved. If it is 0.2 to 0.29, then this is marginal. They are acceptable items, but still they need some improvement. And if it is up to 0.39, then they are reasonably good. And if it's uh, 0.4 and above, then they are very good uh, 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 items. Now, the usefulness of this is that by looking at the difficulty index and discrimination index, we can choose good uh, items, good questions from the examination and they can be uh, placed in the question bank. And at the same time, we can identify the questions which need improvement. So we can work on this, uh, those questions and improve them for future use. High discrimination of an item indicates students with high scores uh, did the item correct, whereas students with low score got it incorrect. And if it is uh, low discrimination or negative discrimination, then it would be uh, vice versa. So in summary, description of learning outcomes must fulfill the SMART criteria. Learning outcomes dictate the teaching approaches and methods of assessment, and that's what we call the constructive alignment. Single best answer and extended matching type of questions are suitable for assessing complex attributes. However, the assessors should be able to avoid the flaws in the question. Difficulty and discrimination indices are useful to improve the multiple choice question items. This session was an overview of a number of topics like learning outcomes, constructive alignment, blueprinting, multiple choice questions, and item analysis. And in fact, each of these topics need a separate elaborate session. If you are interested, uh, we have videos on these topics under our MET and webinar series. And this is the YouTube link, and you can look at the videos uh, on these topics. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Prof. Alam. Uh, really informative and very interesting topic and uh, a very interesting presentation as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, now we open the floor for uh, a question and answer session. So if anybody has uh, any question, please uh, unmute yourself and feel free to 
uh, ask your question for, to Prof. Alam directly. Dr. Baraka, yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alam, for a nice presentation and uh, oral view of these questions and the type of question and their interpretation. My question is that with regard to the questions, uh, for example, multiple choice question, you set a different question. Can we access these questions and their level of difficulty by computer? There is any software we can, which we can use to, uh, to calculate discrepancy factor or I mean discrimination factor by itself from the computer or we have to do all these things manually? No, no, it, it's, 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 uh, you can get it very easily from the computer because okay. when you use the optical reader and okay. when you feed in these uh, answer sheets along with the result, the optical reader would, would calculate the difficulty index and discrimination index for you. The reason I explained it manually was to really show that how these are calculated and how these are interpreted. Because the computer software would simply give us the result. Now we yes. need to know how to interpret uh, mm -hmm. those figures, but you really don't have to calculate yourself. The software will do it for you. Okay, so, uh, because in our university, we have different software. We are using the Moodle and we set up the question and go into the CLO and we get the percentage at the end. So can we use them to calculate these things, difficulty index or discriminatory index? Yeah, or I, I, I think we need to find out whether that the optical reader you are using has uh, this in software installed. installed. If not, uh, I don't think it's difficult to get it installed. And, and use it. I, I feel that this is really, really useful. And um, if you're, um, let's say in university, uh, the uh, different faculties are using these types of questions, then you can have a central place where this optical reader is there. So it can be used by the whole university, not only by one faculty. Thank you very much, Dr. Alam. Thank you for the nice reply. Thank you. I will try to follow with you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Any other questions, uh, our colleagues? Yes. <clears throat> yes, Please Dr. Try. Abdel Sadiq. Yeah. Yes, thank you for your very interesting uh, presentation. And really, we have benefited from this presentation. My question regarding discrimination index. It right. is usually it is usually measured from pilot study or that you after the exam is done. Right. Yes, it it it, it the both the difficulty index and discrimination index would be calculated after the exam is over because this depends upon the response of the student. But the usefulness is in future because based on these results, you can pick up the good questions and you can also learn the weaknesses which were present in those questions. Although the previous batch did not benefit from it, but the future batch would definitely benefit from that. And at the same time, if you are maintaining a question bank by using this discrimination index and difficulty index, you can choose questions which should go into your question bank because question banks should have the quality questions rather than poor questions. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to try uh, In a follow up to this, Dr. Uh, Dr. Alam, yes. uh, what are the different options in which you have a combination of both the uh, difficulty index and the discrimination index. So let's say we have a negative discrimination index <laughs> that is average difficulty, and we like the average difficulty questions, but at the same time, it's a negative discrimination one. Right. Okay. Yeah, because was they... Or you will just reject all negative discrimination questions without uh, uh, thinking yeah. about uh, the quality yeah. or, yeah. or definitely or... definitely negative discrip uh, discrimination we would reject irrespective right of, uh, yeah irrespective okay. of difficulty but mm -hmm. if you look at the two tables which i gave the optimal difficulty and the reasonable uh, discrimination index 
these would be the questions which would be selected straightforward. But the other questions, you can again look at, at those questions. I mean, you may not throw them straight away. You can look at them and uh, your vetting committee or uh, the, 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 the academic staff may help to improve those questions. So uh, the, we have to see that both the difficulty index and discrimination index are inacceptable. Uh, but negative description definitely, as I mentioned earlier, we have to take three steps. Mm -hmm. If it's a negative discrimination, please look whether the uh, model answer has been keyed uh, rightly or wrongly, because if the model answer is keyed wrongly, that would become it, uh, make it difficult. Yes, right? human so, errors are expected here. Yeah, and uh, but then second is that whether the question is clear or not. If the key is right and question is clear, that means that students do not understand that topic, and that should go uh, would, should be informed to the relevant uh, exhibitions that students need uh, further, uh, you know, training in this area. So that is another. Uh, use of uh, this uh, difficulty index. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you talked about the difficulty index and uh, you mentioned the maximum perfect score and the mean chance score. Right. I, I actually I didn't get these uh, these two uh, items. Right. Well, okay. I didn't understand them. Yeah, okay. Let, well, let me explain. Let's yeah. say we, we have... Uh, uh, a BAQ, uh, which has four options or four items, right? Great. So if we want to calculate the guessing, so each of these four statements has 0.25 or 25% chance of being guessed, right? So yeah, be. the whole question has one mark, but each uh, and the option, the chance of guessing is 0.25. So what we do is one plus 0.25, which is the chance. So it would become 1.25. And then you take its average and that average would be the optimal difficulty. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can use that for each option or you can use for whole question as well. So this is the once you got the, the uh, results from the OMR, then you can interpret uh, those OMR, OMR results based on, on this. So to understand the mean chance score is actually the percentage of guessing. If it is four uh, options, it is 0.25. But if it is five, then it would be one over five is 0.2. So that's the basically a guessing uh, chance. I hope that uh, clarifies the point. Yeah, it is. Thank you very much. Right. Any other questions, colleagues? Dr. Adi, you want to? Yes, comment? yes. Please. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you. There is multiple choice question with five cho choices or four choices. Uh, from your opinion, do you consider that with five options is more effective in measure, in measuring the learning outcome? Uh, actually, it, it's, it, there's no major difference uh, in outcome, whether it's four or five. Uh, with five, actually, it's difficult, especially the, the best answer question, because each option has to be... Um, correct to certain level. So it's not easy to find five statements which are correct as well as not the best. So we use four. And statistically, uh, the with four statements, we get the adequate results. So, uh, but if you are using the true false type, which we are not using anymore, uh, if you use that, then there would be five. But for, for um, this uh, single best answer, four uh, options are, are good enough. Thank you. Great. Uh, any other questions from the audience? 
Dr. Alson, you want to say something? Assalamu alaikum, uh, Jamian. Uh, uh, Professor Baraka Jazak al Khair. Well, I would like really to, uh, uh, to welcome warmly uh, our Professor Alam. And really, it's a great opportunity uh, to have you uh, uh, with our faculty. Uh, oh, with very all the, of you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. With all the immense uh, knowledge and uh, expertise uh, that you have uh, shown in all your events, which I follow for the last uh, one year uh, or so. And uh, I'm quite happy that uh, uh, you have delivered to us the state of art of uh, uh, exams and difficulty of uh, MCQs and uh, uh, the rest of the scoring uh, and analysis of uh, MCQ, which will really impose a uh, uh, the quality of uh, of exams in our uh, our college, and uh, we, we we inshallah uh, look in the near future to have you again in uh, uh, in similar uh, similar topics that you could elaborate and uh, and share with us your expertise. And uh, I really applaud efforts uh, in delivering for a vast majority of the world now. Uh, Professor Alam is delivering a class of art. Uh, in uh, lecturing in different uh, aspects of uh, student learning uh, and student uh, performance uh, uh, across the globe. So uh, we are really very, uh, and I apologize for all my colleagues that uh, because I was uh, uh, for these or five days or so. So thank you, Professor uh, Baraka, for uh, 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 assisting in. Uh, uh, introducing Professor Alam, and I hope all our colleagues have enjoyed uh, uh, really the uh, uh, the vast knowledge uh, that uh, Professor Alam has in uh, uh, MCQ exams and uh, uh, analysis, etc. Uh, thank you very much. Really, very appreciate it, and uh, wish all the uh, our faculty best. Uh, thank you uh, very much, sir, for your kind words. Thank you. Uh, it, yeah, it, it, thank you. It, uh, it matters a lot for me. We also thank you very much, Prof. Uh, uh, Hassan, for arranging for uh, uh, this very nice and inform informative uh, session with Prof. Uh, Alam. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to our respected Dean, Dr. Khairi. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. At the end of the, this presentation, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alam, for, for this uh, very informative uh, and detailed uh, uh, presentations uh, regarding the, uh, for example, the CLO and the MSQ quality and types, etc. Actually, uh, you explained clearly to us uh, how uh, can we handle different uh, difference between these uh, MSQ's questions uh, and their types as they are very important uh, assessment tools. Uh, as well, we feel that uh, you linked very well between the uh, learning outcomes and the, uh, the assessment tools or MSQ questions. So, very uh, thanks for you and the uh, gratitude for, and we appreciate as well your time and effort uh, to uh, present this uh, presentation, wishing as well to have future uh, collaborations with you regarding the education assessment process, inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Khairi. And uh, thank you, everyone who joined us today for this informative webinar on categorizing of exam multiple choice questions based on difficulty level and course learning outcomes. We hope that you found the session insightful and that the strategies discussed will help you enhance the quality of your exams and improve the student learning outcomes. I would like to express my gratitude to our distinguished speaker, Dr. Alam, for sharing his expertise with us 
Your insights have been invaluable and we appreciate your time and efforts in delivering such a comprehensive presentation. Lastly, I encourage all attendees to provide feedback on the webinar through the provided survey link. Your feedback is important to us as we strive to continuously improve our webinar offerings. Thank you again for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Uh, Professor Barakat, just a minute. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the uh, uh, our uh, Professor uh, Gattas. Uh, very appreciated. He directed to uh, uh, start uh, some webinars on uh, MCQ and the build of MCQ, etc. So really, very appreciated, uh, Professor Gattas. And also, uh, Professor Bustanuddin, thank you very much for facilitating uh, the, uh, the launch of this uh, workshop. And of course, definitely our members, uh, Professor Sosan and uh, Professor Suhad, the members of CBD committee uh, at the branch here at uh, Abu Dhabi branch. And definitely Professor Baraka is chair of the CBD program. And thank you all of you, Professor Khairi, Professor Adil, uh, and the rest of my colleagues for joining us, all of you. And have a nice Friday. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks once again, Prof. Alam. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alam. Thank you. Thank very you. appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor you. Alam. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Professor Barakah. Thank you, Professor Asif. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jazakallah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Shukran, Shukran, Shukran Dr. Barak. Shukran, Dr. Asif. Shukran, Dr. Thank Alam. You. Thanks a lot. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very looking, forward, look, look, looking forward to receive uh, the, the, uh, the, the recorded video. I was interrupted many times uh, with phone, phone calls. Uh, I just feel that I miss uh, a big chunk of a really interesting topic and presentation. Thanks, Dr. Alam, of course. And uh, I, was, I, I would just love to, to, to just receive, the, I don't know if, if, I, if it's possible to receive a PDF of the presentation or the video recording, whatever it is. Uh, but of course, it uh, was amazing. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I have already shared the PDF format with uh, Dr. Asim. So I think he can share with you all. And that would uh, be great. It, it was attached to the announcement. Maybe uh, some of our colleagues they didn't see it. It, no. it was attached to the announcement uh, yesterday. Right. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, sure. We will yeah. share again. We'll yeah. Check it out. Okay. Yeah, great. Thanks. The video will, will be again. a great help as well. Uh, we will be, inshallah, yeah. contacting, sure. uh, keeping in contact with Prof. Alam to uh, to get the recording so that everyone will get the benefit of it again and revisit again when we need, inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, great, right. thanks, great, right. great. Right. thanks, thanks, great. Right. Can, can, can I ask, much. can I have one comment, please, the Katra? Uh, it's Thank you, Dr. Alam. Thank you for the amazing. Thank you, Dr. Asim, Dr. Baraka, for arranging such amazing uh, presentation. I really love it. And the way uh, you explained it was amazing. The huge number of information that help us, uh, every single person in this um, Zoom will benefit from what you uh, introduced. Uh, however, Dr. Alam, I believe that um, we'll deepen our understanding more if we can conduct a workshop that uh, continuously explain more and more how, how we can conduct this. So I follow up with you. I love the uh, the way you uh, use the assessment, but if we, if there is any chance for future uh, workshop, virtual workshop, that we can do it uh, hand in hand, if we can perform it once, we can perform it more. And if someone of us uh, learn how to calculate the um, assessment, we can teach others. So if there is any possibility, that would be amazing. Uh, actually, actually, I had... Uh initially planned to have a hands-on activity at the end of today's session, but because the time was uh, only one hour, so uh, we, we, we couldn't do that. So for that kind of uh, uh, workshop, we need around three hours. Uh, so, so there is a briefing and then there are group work and the people uh, work on the task and then we present and discuss. So. We, we need more more time for that. But uh, I, I will be happy to contribute uh, uh, if needed. Yeah. I don't know if Dr. Baraka, Dr. Asim, if you can help us arranging such workshop, it would be really, really helpful for every single 
person of us. Inshallah, this was love. We'll keep in touch with Prof. Alam, and inshallah, we'll, we'll try to arrange for another session while we have enough time, inshallah, to do this uh, uh, hands-on training, bismillah. Thanks, but, but, <clears throat> but until now, we only share with us the PDF of the presentation. Or, or yes, the yes. But, the PDF is already shared. It's uh, attached to the email. And uh, inshallah, we'll share the uh, uh, video recording once we get it from Prof. Alam, inshallah. Thank you. Uh, I, I know. I know. It's, it was very interesting. It was very insightful, and uh, uh, I myself uh, uh, I'm ready to 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 hear it um, uh, several times again. To uh, as a as an invaluable source for us, inshallah. Yeah, I I, I will share the the recording as soon as possible, inshallah. Uh, inshallah. Uh, so I'll 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 send uh, uh, the link through through the WhatsApp, so then everybody can can share that. Thank you, Dr. Alam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Shukran, Dr. Baraka. Shukran, Dr. Asim. Allah Khalika, Prof. Allah Khalika. Allah Khalika, Prof. Allah Khalika. Allah Khalika, Prof. Allah Khalika. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.